All right, I think we'll get started. Welcome, everyone. So this is part two of a series of two talks on the monoidal by on monoidal by categories of critical points. I'm going to briefly recall the story from last time, which started with dynamical systems. And then specialized to a particular kind of dynamical system, which is one that comes from the gradient of a function. I think I was calling it H last time. I can't remember. So H is a potential for that uh, vector field, F. So that's a potential. To understand such a dynamical system, what you want to do is linearize it around, well, that's a first step, linearize the system around zeros of the vector field nabla h, i.e. that's what a critical point is, critical point of h. So we have some smooth function h, we look at its critical points, we linearize that system around those critical points. That means introducing the Hessian, uh, so that means we start caring about the Hessian of h, the matrix of second order partial derivatives. And we talked about the Morse lemma, which says that because that matrix, the Hessian, is the linear information about what that system is doing near any critical point. Um, so the Hessian controls the system beha system's behavior near a critical point. And critical points I was calling X star. And the Morse lemma said that if you take that Hessian at a critical point, and if that's invertible, then near x star, your function looks like some normal form in local coordinates, uh, which is the sum of p squares minus a sum of q squares. And such a critical point is called a non-degenerate critical point. All right. Um, So what we've done in trying to understand these systems is sort of ended up talking about a certain kind of polynomial, homogeneous of degree two, and that's a quadratic form. There's another way of thinking about quadratic forms. Instead of thinking about them as a uh, homogeneous polynomial of degree two, you can read off the coefficients and think of them as a matrix. So that's the first thing I want to present. So I want to talk about quadratic forms as matrices, uh, and then talk about maybe what it, what it might mean to have a morphism between quadratic forms or uh, between non-degenerate critical points, and then start organizing all of this into a category. Are there any questions about this summary? From me? Okay. Yeah. No, not from you. Good. All right. 
given a, let's just say smooth function h and a critical point x star of h we define or you can take the tangent space of u at x a u is an open subset of rd um, some d For our purposes, it's not like the topology of U is interesting. It's just, you can take that to be an open ball. It doesn't matter, everything's local. So if I take the tangent space, which is just some affine space, uh, and there's, an, there's a pairing on that, by which I mean a symmetric bilinear form. Defined as follows. So the, the tangent space is spanned by the partial derivatives d dx i and d dx j, and I define their pairing to be the following number. Take the second order, I just apply those two differential operators to f, and then I evaluate at x star. That's some number, and that defines what's clearly, since the partial derivatives are symmetric, a symmetric uh, exp extend this from a basis and you get a symmetric bilinear form on that space. So that's also, uh, so sometimes such a pair is called a quadratic space. Uh, a vector space equipped with, in this case, well, uh, maybe one restricts that to cases where the bilinear form is non-degenerate. Uh, Should that f be a, be a h there? Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, my notes are using f. So. Thanks. Okay, so the matrix of this bilinear form, so any symmetric bilinear form, if you just write down these pairings as a matrix, uh, in this case, those entries in that matrix are just clearly the Hessian of H evaluated at X star. So, uh, X star is a non-degenerate critical point if and only if this bilinear form is non-degenerate meaning that if some vector v pairs with everything to give zero, then v has to be zero. That's a little exercise on a finite dimensional vector space. An injective map is surjective if and only if it's bijective. Okay, such a pair is called a quadratic space. Right, so to a non-degenerate uh, critical point, we can associate this quadratic space, which is basically just the Hessian viewed in a slightly different way. Uh, let me see. I think I have one more reminder, which is that for this h equals hpq that I defined on the previous board, um, remember the, the way to think about that as a sort of dynamical system is to view there as being p orthogonal axes along near which solutions tend to run away. From the origin. This picture is misleading, of course, because these directions are meant to be orthogonal, and I'm about to draw more than two of them in the plane. But you're used to that kind of thing. 
with P axes along which solutions approach, sorry, run away from the origin and the Q in which they uh, approach the origin. Okay, so when you think about, uh, so to this standard, so this is a non-degenerate, well, it has a non-degenerate critical point at the origin. And that's our standard example of a, a function with a non-degenerate critical point. And we can take the quadratic space associated to that, uh, which just has the pairings, which if I take the second order partial derivatives, well, uh, Let's see, maybe I'll squeeze it down here. Um, if I take the Hessian of HPQ, it's just a bunch of ones and then a bunch of minus ones. I think we discussed that last time. All right, I think that's enough review. So let's get on to the new stuff. I want to start discussing how one might make this into a category. Well, I invite you to think about it. So I have these different ways of thinking about these objects, right? A, a non-degenerate critical point, I can think about it as a polynomial. Maybe morphisms between polynomials is a bit hard to think about. I can think about it as a quadratic space. Well, a vector space, you know what a morphism between those is. It's a linear map. And if I have some sort of structure on that vector space, like a pairing, well, it makes sense to take a linear map that somehow is compatible with that structure. So as is usually the case, you want to have five different ways of thinking about everything because your question probably makes more sense in one of the ways than others. So how do you... Let's start with the non-degenerate critical points. Degenerate ones are interesting, perhaps more interesting, but the non-degenerate ones are easier as objects of a category. Well, one of the reasons to want to make sense of morphisms between such things is to make sense of symmetries. Okay, so, if, well, I guess maybe even before we try and make sense of morphisms, we might want to convince ourselves there's uh, any reason to think there's an interesting answer. Right, so maybe let's just observe that there are, there are obvious symmetries of these gadgets. So for example, in this quadratic form, sorry, uh, in this potential, uh, we can exchange x1 for x2, or even x1 for minus x2, without changing the potential. Well, so what? Well, that's meaningless at the level of the potential, but it does have some meaning at the level of trajectories, right? It means that if we have one trajectory, I mean, this, this operation here might not do anything to the potential, but it certainly changes a trajectory. Right? It exchanges the axes, so it'll reflect the trajectory in some way, um, a trajectory. Okay, so that operation means that you know it reduces this sort of set of trajectories that need to be considered, I suppose. Okay, so a symmetry of the potential uh, should be best understood as a symmetry of the set of solutions. That's one way of thinking about what these symmetries mean. All right. Well, the symmetry is a bit easier to think about than a general morphism because it's bijective. So, uh, so it's fairly clear that 
a symmetry. of a quadratic space. V with a pairing. So remember that means a finite dimensional vector space. We might as well say over R with a bilinear form, which is non-degenerate. So that should be a linear bijective map. f from v to v, which preserves the form, that is, which is an isometry. For all u and v. Okay, so if we just, I mean, that's pretty clear. I think most of you have encountered something like that before. Uh, but that means that we sort of have a candidate reasonable notion for what it means to have a morphism of this thing to itself right because maybe if we think about that thing as the set of trajectories of the nonlinear dynamical system which has this as its potential or what's similar replace it by the linearized version at the origin which is this tangent space at zero of some open neighborhood of the origin together with the pairing we discussed which you know is essentially just the hessian of that h. This is of course h21. Right? Well, we know what a symmetry or isomorphism of that thing with itself is. It's an isometry. So if we have an isometry f, we can think about that as an isometry or an isomorphism of that potential with itself. Okay, by just sort of thinking about these things as basically the same. Okay, so there's a category of uh, quadratic spaces, which I'll now define based on this discussion. But it's not so clear yet that there are interesting examples of morphisms that aren't isomorphisms. So definition. A category Q of quadratic spaces has as objects, finite dimensional vector spaces. This makes sense over any field. I guess when I'm in the earlier discussion, I was talking about real numbers because I was talking about dynamical systems. But so we'll stick with that. But that's not uh, Changing the field changes the classification of critical points. So I've presented the classification for the real numbers, these HPQs. For the, <clears throat> for the complex numbers, the classification looks different and similarly for other fields. Okay, so that's what we discussed. That's a quadratic space. They're the objects and morphisms are just linear maps that preserve the form. So the set of morphisms in Q I'll just write V and W for the quadratic space and leave the pairing as implicit structure. So that's a linear transformation from V to W, such that if I pair the outputs in W, it's the same as pairing them in the inputs in V. And it's easy to check that's a category. Okay, but well, I've given you one example of a, an isomorphism in that category on the previous board. Um, an example of a, um, a morphism that's not an isomorphism. Well, here's one. Um, maybe I'll introduce this as general notation. So I'm going to write XPQ for the quadratic space, which is associated to the HPQ. So if you think about it, the tangent space will have as a basis R DDX1. So remember, I'm going to write the coordinates as I did before as PXIs minus QXJs, sorry, QYJs. 
So the tangent space has the x coordinates and the y coordinates. And then the pairing uh, Well, to do that, I have to apply that pair of differential operators to h. Of course, that gives me 0. So the x's and the y's are all orthogonal. This is just delta ij and similarly for the y's. And so that's a quadratic space. And I'm going to present a morphism uh, Gonna have to do it on the other board, it's a bit annoying. But I'm going to give you a morphism from x10 to x11. Uh, yeah, I'll start the other boards. Okay, so ddx1 pairs with itself to give 1 here. That's the only... Going on, and I won't repeat that. So what's the map going to do? Well, I just have to tell you where uh, ddx1 goes to, and not surprisingly, I'm going to send it to ddx1. So I just have to check that ddx1 pairs with itself to give 1 here, and of course it does. Um, okay, so in terms of a picture, what's this example? Well, think about this phase space portrait that I still have on that other board there. Uh, X10 means a single axis with solutions going away from the origin, right? So. Oops. Maybe I'll draw it in orange. Okay, so this is x10 in orange. Uh, x11 has a pair of x1 with uh, one axis looking like the orange one, and then another axis which I'll draw in green. Okay, so this morphism sits. Uh, one of the axes inside the pair of axes. Okay. Um, there is... similarly an obvious morphism from x01 to x11. Maybe you can think about what that does. So it might be natural, I mean, especially given the picture, right, in which somehow that, that total space is literally a direct sum of these two copies, right? So the whole space is a direct sum of that axis with that axis. So you might think that x11 is actually a direct sum in the category of x10 and x01. Uh, but that's, that's not the case. It's actually a tensor product rather than a sum. Well, you can see that's not true because there's no morphism. If it was a direct sum, there would have to be a projection map from x11 to x10. And you can check that there's no such maps. That's a nice exercise. Okay, so what is the relationship between... Uh, so. Of course, the general point is I have these I have this classification of these non-degenerate critical points over R, these HPQs or XPQs, uh, 
somehow I know from the picture XPQ is made up of P copies of X10, right? Something like that anyway. And then Q copies of X01. And the question I'm getting at is, well, what is the actual relationship here? How do I build XPQ from Q copies of that, P copies of the first X10 and Q copies of X01? So what is the what is the relationship here? Well, it's not a direct sum, but it is a tensor product. So in fact, X11 is a tensor product of these. This is a monoidal category. Okay, so what I want to now do is explain this monoidal structure and uh, how this is the case. Any questions? So this category of quadratic spaces is a monoidal category. <laughs> Under the direct sum operation. So that's not confusing at all. Okay, so the point is that if I take two quadratic spaces, say V with its pairing, and I tensor W with its pairing. What is the new quadratic form? Well, the underlying vector space is just the direct sum. And the pairing I put on that is defined as follows. Uh, if you want to pair, uh, I'll just write V for vectors in V and W for vectors in W. So if you want to pair V with V prime, you just use the pairing in V. If you want to pair W with W prime, you just pair them in W. Viewing W and V as subspaces in the canonical way of the direct sum. And if you want to pair things one from each space, you just get zero. All right. So that's uh, a new quadratic space. This is easily checked. And you can check that that's a monoidal category. But then clearly, if you think about it, uh, the way I've defined it, x10 tensor x01 is x11. And more generally, xpq is x p0 tensor x 0 q, but we can say more than that. This is x 1 0 to the tensor power, and this is x 0 1 to the qth tensor power. Okay, so that means that, uh, well, remember that's a generic object up to isomorphism in Q, right? So that means every object can be generated using the tensor from x10 and x01. Uh, hi guys, welcome. Uh, actually, uh, the camera which is recording this talk is a bit obstructed by the boards you're putting up. So if you wouldn't mind maybe putting the personal boards up somewhere else. I'm not sure if you can. Uh, hear me, so I'll just type that in the chat. Excuse me for a moment, guys. Yeah, if they don't, then I'll just have to kick them. Any questions? Uh, none from me. <clears throat> okay, so Q, Q is a very simple monoidal category. 
Okay, but let's let's go further than this Q. So it's not very interesting, right? We're not seeing here anything more than we put in, really. So the next step is to go from from the quadratic space V to the Clifford algebra. C of V. And we'll talk about its modules and its bimodules, and that will get us from a category Q to something which is like a bi category that plays something, that plays a similar role. So the Clifford algebra of a quadratic form is has a universal property. I'll give the universal property and then tell you how to construct it such a thing. So it's universal among algebras. So consider all our algebras C, which are associative and unital, uh, together with a linear map, iota from V to C, satisfying iota V, iota W, plus EO to W, EO to V is twice the pairing of V and W times the identity element in C. So this is, <clears throat> this is a scalar. It's a real number, so I can multiply the identity by it in C. So this relation uh, can hold in C or not. And you look at all pairs consisting of C and EOTA, which satisfy this, and among them is a universal one through which all the other ones factor, and that's the Clifford algebra. So uh, this algebra exists. It is naturally Z mod 2 graded. This canonical, this map Yota in the case of the canonical uh, the universal solution uh, is injective and sits V inside the degree one part of the Z2 graded algebra. And CV is two to the dimension of V dimensional. So it's two to the N dimensional where N is the dimension of the original quadratic space. Okay, so it's it's in some sense the uh, so it is the representation of V. Okay, excuse me. So it's the sort of avatar of the quadratic space in the category of algebras. Now what I want to observe is that this assignment to a quadratic space of its Clifford algebra is functorial. So we can turn everything in the category Q into stuff involving algebras. So if I take a morphism in Q, then by the universal property, we get a unique morphism of, it's actually degree zero, but in the Z2 grading, but we don't care about that right now. Uh, a unique morphism of algebras, we'll just write CT for it, making the following diagram commute. <clears throat> 
And well, the, the proof of that is just to observe that uh, if I have T and I post compose it with the inclusion of W into its Clifford algebra, that composite there uh, satisfies, um, is a linear map satisfying this equation, right? Because if I take iota T V, oh, sorry, if I take iota T of V, iota T W, plus iota T W, iota T V, then using that iota is linear and T is linear, uh, and T uh, preserves um, the pairing, what we'll find is that that's uh, 2 VW times the identity. And that is the property. I mean, uh, CV is, un is universal among algebra maps, linear maps out of V into algebras, uh, which satisfy this equation and therefore uh, that universal property induces CT. Okay, so the upshot is that we can take this kind of thing, which is what Q is made of, and turn it into this kind of thing, which is uh, something, an arrow in the category of algebras. So I'm not going to prove this or even define all the terms involved, but hopefully you sort of have some idea of what it's saying anyway. So there's a strong monoidal functor. From Q to, well, the category of Z2 graded algebras and their morphisms. So this is quadratic spaces, as defined earlier. This is Z2 graded algebras and morphisms of algebras. And I've just sketched how that functor works on objects and on morphisms. To say it's strong monoidal is simply to say that if you hit the tensor product in Q with this functor, what you get is the tensor product, something isomorphic naturally and in a coherent way to the tensor product of these Z2 graded algebras. Okay, maybe this seems very abstract, but actually you know these algebras very well. You understand everything in the image of this functor. You've seen all of these ingredients before. So. Remember the objects on the left-hand side are just the XPQs up to isomorphism, because that's the classification. So what's C of X zero zero? Well, there's no relations to impose, so that's just uh, the R algebra R. What about X zero one? Well, look on the board, I guess to my left as my character is standing. Um, look at that equation mark it in blue. So what is that? Uh, yeah, I guess I haven't actually sketched the construction at all, have I? So it's a bit hard to answer this question. Um, maybe I should do that. Uh, yeah, I'll do that here. So to take the actual construction is I take the uh, tensor algebra of V modulo the relations which are imposed by that, that equation blue star. That is uh, V tensor W plus W tensor V minus 2VW. So the way to think about that is, uh, okay, so in this case, there's only one generator, which I could write ddy. And what equation am I imposing on it when I do this? Well, v and w are both ddy. So the left-hand side of that equation, which I'm imposing 
So the equation is something like VW plus WV is 2V paired with W, right? But if V is equal to W, that simply says 2V squared is equal to 2VW. And that says V squared is equal to is equal to v paired with v, which is the norm of v squared. <laughs> okay, we're quite popular tonight. Hi guys, uh, I mean, I'm giving a talk right now, so if you really walked into a real talk and started pushing the speaker, this might happen. They're welcome to return and behave. Um, okay, so if you square, so what I'm doing by taking this quotient of the tensor algebra is introducing formally in my algebra uh, an element which squares to whatever this number is. But what is this number in the case of 0, 1? Well, uh, when I pair this with itself, by definition, I get minus 1. So what am I doing? I'm freely adjoining a new um, coordinate to my original vector space, which in this case is a one-dimensional R vector space, and I'm imposing that its square is minus one. So of course that is the R algebra C. Uh, what about x0, 2? Well, in this case I'm adjoining two square roots of minus one, and they anti-commute. So that's the uh, quaternions. Okay, so um, these algebras you're familiar with. Uh, okay, so what I've now sketched for you is is going from a critical point to a quadratic space and going from a quadratic space to a Clifford algebra. Okay, back to the first board. <laughs> so, so far there have been no bi categories, so maybe it's appropriate in the last 10 minutes to have some bi categories. Um, so, going back to the notation, I go from a critical point of H to the quadratic space, which is this pair with the Hessian. To that I associate the Clifford algebra. And to this, this is the next step. Well, even better than algebra is its category of modules. So I can take the abelian category mod, and I'll take Z2 graded modules. So that's a module. So a, ve a module is a vector space together with an action of this algebra, and I take Z2 graded modules. So they come in two pieces, even and odd, and the algebra has elements that are even and odd, and these act in a way that either leaves the degree the same if the element of the algebra has degree zero and uh, increases it by one if it's an odd element. Okay. Well, why do that? So that's the question that I now need to answer. So we've, I'm sort of sketching out a path from critical points to here, if I can convince you that considering these categories of modules is a reasonable thing, then uh, then you're sort of convinced that there's a, a natural reason to introduce by categories in the context of critical points. <laughs> 
So why go to the abelian category? Well, the reason is that uh, something happens. There's a deep theorem. So this is not very interesting. I mean, it's cute, but it's not interesting. There's nothing non-trivial there. We don't get anything out that we didn't put in. This is also not very interesting. Well, we know those algebras, right? Yeah, the real numbers, quaternions, they're interesting, but there's nothing deep to say about that. But once we go to this level, the level of the abelian categories, there's the following very deep theorem, which is called bot periodicity. And bot periodicity says there is an equivalence of categories between this category, this abelian category that I associated to uh, XPQ and the abelian category I associate to XPQ plus eight. Now, I want to point out it's very much uh, the case that as vector spaces and as quadratic spaces, you know, these are all distinct. Right? If the pair PQ is different to the pair P prime Q prime, then those are not isomorphic objects of Q. So this isn't trivial. There's no, there's no obvious relationship between X PQ and x p q plus eight at this level or at this level but suddenly when we go to the level of abelian categories we find that they're deeply related in fact in a way that's obscured uh, if you're talking about these less these sort of categorical dimension uh, below below this one I won't go into why bot periodicity is true or what it means, but uh, it's it's of great importance. Okay, so what we see here is that we start with this very simple object. If we go up to this more fancy level of mathematical formalism, there's a deep relation between different, apparently different, kinds of critical points. Um, and this is one of the mo motivations for working at that level. All right, so let me see now. Okay, so what is it, I guess I should say, what it means, technically speaking, to work at that level, to, to work with those abelian categories, and, and what does it mean to, to have a bi category? So at the heuristic level, the picture is the following. I'm going to, this is a curly A. So this is the functor we considered before, which sends a quadratic space to its Clifford algebra. So these are algebras and algebra maps. It's like C and C prime and some linear map which preserves the multiplication. But there's a way of sort of uh, adding an extra dimension to that category, which is to take algebras, Z2 graded algebras over R, like C and the quaternions. But instead of having between C and C prime just morphisms of algebras, is to put bimodules. Uh, let's say M and N. So M and N are vector spaces which are acted on the left by C prime and acted on the right by C in a way that's compatible. Maybe I'll define that more carefully in a moment. Um, you can, th that's not in any sense a function from C to C prime. So when I draw this arrow here, it's in the category theory sense, right? I'm just, this is the data and I'm just declaring that I want to think about it as an arrow from C to C prime, which nobody can stop me. 
but then I can have arrows between arrows. So gamma can then be an honest function. So it's a an R linear map, which is compatible with those actions. So if you act on the left on an element, it comes out the front. If you act on the right, it comes out the front. So that's a bimodule map. Okay, and this thing, this is an example of a bi category. Okay, so this here is, is where these categories like mod Z2, R, C, and mod Z2, R, C prime come into the story. Because a bimodule like that can be thought of as a functor between those two categories, given by the tensor product. So if I have a left C prime, right C bimodule, say M, then what I can do so on the left, I have C prime, and on the right, I have C. So given a C module, I can tensor over C with M and end up with a C prime module. So this, well, that tensor product is actually a functor from here to here. Okay, so that's a sketch of how this bike category is defined. Now let me formally define it. So definition. The by category, I'm going to call it crit NDG for non-degenerate critical points. Has as objects, well, quadratic spaces, or you can think of them as being their Clifford algebras. And so we'll just think about that as think about them as being algebras, it doesn't matter. And then from V to W, again think about that as C V and C W, an arrow in the by category, M. So one morphisms. For example, M so that's a CW CV biomodule Z2 graded, i.e. a vector space with a left action by CW, a right action by CV, which makes it the first case into a left CW module, and the second case into a right CV module, uh, such that there's an associativity condition. So C uh, M C prime is equal to C M C prime for all C and C, C prime and C prime, M and M. So that's the bimodule condition. This thing here. So it should be finite dimensional as a vector space, it should be Z2 graded, it should have this action. Uh, so that's a one morphism from the quadratic space V to the quadratic space W. And between those, I can have two morphisms, which are just bimodule maps, as I sketched <clears throat> on the previous book. Okay. Uh, to define a bi category, I have to tell you how to compose. So if I have V, W, and U, U is another quadratic space. So I think about that as CU. And if that's N, another bi module. Uh, so the composite of N with M is defined to be just tensoring. So I tensor over the intermediate algebra. And then N still has a left CU action, and M still has a right CV action. So after that tensor product, I have a CU-CV bimodule, which is the kind of thing I need to define an arrow like that. 
So there's lots of details tied up in checking that's a byte category, but it is. Um, let's see. So I think I want to finish by interpreting the, oh, the camera has been looking at the wrong thing this whole time. That's unfortunate. Uh, okay, so I was writing the left-hand board just now. Right. Um, so theorem crit NDG is monoidal. Q is monoidal, right? And I want you to think about this as a kind of sophisticated version of Q. So how do I tensor? Well, the objects are just quadratic spaces, right? So I can just tensor them <laughs> exactly as I tensored them before. This is a bit of a stupid equation, but uh, so if viewing V and W as objects of crit NDG, uh, their tensor product is a new object of crit NDG, and it is just the tensor product of those that pair of objects in Q. And then you have to define what that does with the, the one morphisms and so on, but that's not something I'm going to do now. Okay, so what is bot periodicity? How do I interpret bot periodicity as a statement in this by category? Well, <clears throat> XPQ is a quadratic space. It's an object in that by category, and so is this. And bot periodicity gives us arrows, M and N. So this thing here has to be some sort of magic uh, by module between these two Clifford algebras. Similarly for n. And they have the property that they compose in either order to be the identity, which uh, what's the identity on a quadratic space in this by category? It has to be an arrow from V to itself. So that is a CV, CV by module. And it's just <clears throat> CV itself. Okay, so bot periodicity says that there exist bimodules like this, such that if you tensor them, you get the Clifford algebra XPQ as a bimodule, and similarly in the reverse order. So this is by no means obvious that such things exist. You can explicitly construct them. I'm not saying it's super mysterious, but uh, it's not. It's not obvious that that such M and N exist. So that's the content of bot periodicity. It says that uh, it says that in this by category. I mean, this is not. You don't have to phrase it this way, of course. In this by category, X P Q is isomorphic as an object to X P Q plus eight. Okay. So I think I'll just maybe summarize in a final board. Well, maybe maybe this board is good. These boards are good enough already. So I've explained to you how to start with well a dynamical system how to think about it as being the critical point of a potential associated to that a quadratic space, a Clifford algebra, its category of modules. Uh, those modules or bimodules um, are the ingredients out of which you build a bi-category. Crit NDG is what I'm calling it here, which has Clifford algebras or quadratic spaces as objects and bimodules as one morphisms. And uh, that by category is the context in which you can state something like bot periodicity. So there's, there's something non-trivial about working at the level of these module categories, which is not visible at the level of the quadratic spaces or the Clifford algebras, not directly anyway.
So this is a kind of introduction to this, uh, this world of viewing critical points through the lens of bi categories. But all I've spoken about here are non-degenerate critical points, right? Things like XPQ. If you want to talk about degenerate critical points, so things that looks like things that look like even something as simple as x cubed as a potential, well, that's that's not an object of this bi category. It's not a quadratic form. So uh, all I've discussed is is sort of the world of non-degenerate critical points, and there's a much larger world of degenerate critical points. And I've made by categorical sense of, of this part in terms of Clifford algebras and bi modules, but out here is a question mark. And that, that out there is, is of course, uh, this is what LG is, the bi category which, <coughs> which we're studying in the seminar series. But it's somewhat more complicated to construct than the sketch that I've given today of the simple piece of it, which is where the quadratic forms live, or the non-degenerate critical points. But I hope that sketch gave you an idea of the uh, sort of conceptual content of that, of that part, anyway. So thanks, everyone. I'll stop there. Uh, any questions? Um, so what does bot periodicity tell us about, like, the actual uh... The singularities and stuff involved, um, you know, in the sense you were talking about them, yeah. say last talk. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, bot periodicity, and there's a version of that for the complex numbers called Knorr periodicity, does appear in physics, but it appears in kind of fancy parts of physics like string theory. So I don't. I wouldn't even be able to explain how it appears in the fancy parts, and I don't know a simple way of explaining what it means at the more elementary level of, say, ODEs. So as far as I don't know any way of saying what bot periodicity means in that context, I think it's a very interesting question. But, but yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is the is that eight there? So we were going through the uh, the Clifford algebras were you know real numbers, complex numbers, quaternions, and then I suppose octonions. Is that eight related to the to that sort of the way those sort of structures stop uh, not a, at that dimension? Yeah. Yeah, not. I mean, it's it's a similar kind of phenomenon, but it's not related to octonions or that series. Um, okay. So to get up. It's, it's kind of a little uh, intricate to fully explain, but so when you go up from, so R, C, the quaternions, the rest up to A are things like a direct sum of two copies of the complex numbers or H plus C and stuff like that. Um, so it's not that you see new algebras, you just see combinations of the existing ones, but um, Yeah, uh, it's the exact algebras you see and, and why they belong in this pattern and the meaning of this pattern um, is would take some time to explain. And I, I think I don't even fully understand it myself. So it's, uh, I mean, I know how to prove this, but I think <laughs> I don't understand it. <laughs> Fair enough. So over the complex numbers, it's much simpler. It's the eight is a two. <laughs> sure. Okay. Uh, so you have, an, you have an eightfold periodicity for the real numbers, and it's just a twofold periodicity for the complex numbers. And that's, that's kind of easier to grasp. But, um, well, what periodicity is a deep fact. So. Yeah. Any other questions? I'm from me. Oh, thanks, everyone. Uh, see you next week. See you next week.